Good afternoon, and welcome to the Digital Turbine Third Quarter Fiscal 2020 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note, this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Brian Bartholomew, Senior Vice President of Capital Markets and Strategy. Please go ahead. Thanks, Gary. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Digital Turbine Fiscal 2020 Third Quarter Earnings Conference Call. Joining me on the call today to discuss our results are CEO Bill Stone and CFO Barrett Garrison. Before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that our remarks today will include forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements are based on our current assumptions, expectations, and beliefs, including projected operating metrics, future products and services, anticipated market demand, and other forward-looking topics. Although we believe that our assumptions are reasonable, they are not guarantees of future performance, and some will inevitably prove to be incorrect. Except as required by law, we undertake no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. For a discussion of the risk factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from those contemplated by our forward-looking statements, please refer to the documents we file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Also, during this call, we will discuss certain non-GAAP measures of our performance. Non-GAAP measures are not substitutes for GAAP measures. Please refer to today's press release for important information about the limitations of using non-GAAP measures, as well as reconciliations of these non-GAAP financial results to the most comparable GAAP measures. Now we'll turn the call over to Mr. Bill Stone. Thanks, Brian, and thank you all for joining our call tonight. I'm gonna to break out my prepared remarks into three areas. First, we'll close out the December quarter. Secondly, we'll provide some operational real-time color on our current growth drivers. And then finally, I wanna spend some time discussing why I'm so excited about the acquisition of Mobile Posse. Closing out the December quarter, we finished with $36 million in revenue and $5.6 million in EBITDA. And while the top-line revenue number fell short of our expectations, largely due to soft device sales with our core U.S. operators in the month of November, we nonetheless managed to exceed expectations for EBITDA as a result of great operational execution in the quarter. I really want to give a shout-out to our entire Digital Turbine team. The team's focus and hustle along with our internal command over key business drivers, really set a positive tone. And from time to time, we'll experience certain uncontrollable near-term factors, such as weaker Android smartphone sales in a particular quarter, but I couldn't be happier with our execution on all aspects of the business within our control. This execution was particularly evident in the December quarter with a record high blended revenue per device, or RPD, north of $3 with our core U.S. operators, which is an increase from just under $2.50 versus prior year, and also meaningful quarter-over-quarter quarter and year-over-year year growth with our international partners. Our revenue per device performance continues to be driven by strong demand among advertisers across numerous categories, including brands, games, and mobile-first applications such as Pandora, Disney+, Apple Music, Snap, Amazon, and others. Barrett will take you through the financials in a few minutes, but for now, I do want to quickly highlight our efficient operating leverage and record cash flows generated during the quarter. This is one of the primary reasons that I get so excited about the inherent potential of our business model. Now that we operate as a cloud-based mobile software company at true scale, we are really starting to harvest the fruits of real operating leverage as our profitability expands at a far faster clip than our revenues. This was evident in the December quarter, a quarter which we managed to grow our EBITDA at a 47% annual rate and generate an all-time record of more than $7 million of free cash flow, even despite headwinds impacting our top-line growth. In addition to our operational prowess of the quarter, I also want to highlight our markedly improved diversification. As you've heard me say many times, we're extremely focused on diversifying our business. Diversifying it by partner, by geography, and by product. 
In terms of pro- partner diversification, our total revenue with our initial U.S. partners, Verizon, AT&T, Cricket, and U.S. Cellular, increased year over year despite a decline in the total combined devices sold and represented just over 70% of our total revenues in the December quarter, which compares to approximately 85% in the year ago December quarter and over 90% in the December quarter two years ago. Helping us in this diversification are our rollouts with newer based U.S. partners such as TrackPhone and international partners such as Samsung and American Mobile. And specifically, with respect to Samsung, and given the importance of this partnership, I want to provide an update on our progress. To date, our software has been installed on more than 7 million unlocked Samsung devices across more than 75 countries. In particular, I want to call out Brazil as a highly strategic market for both us and Samsung. Samsung has the majority OEM market share in Brazil, and we are focused on growing our business, not only with Samsung in Brazil, but also Telefonica, American Mobile, and others. We currently believe that we have line of sight to having our software on the vast majority of devices in the Brazilian market by the end of this calendar year. And with this expectation in mind, we continue to invest on the ground resources in Latin America to best ensure that we optimally capitalize on our wealth of opportunities in the Brazil and the surrounding areas. I'd also like to announce today that we have a partnership with AT&T in Mexico that we expect to launch this summer. For context, AT&T Mexico has approximately 20 million subscribers. And we expect this partner diversification trend to continue going forward as Samsung and other new partner rollouts such as Telefonica continue to progress. And as we add additional partners such as LG to the platform. We're very excited to formally announce our global partnership with LG today. We've already begun working on integration and go-to-market plans with LG and expect this partnership to begin contributing revenues this summer. Similar to our announced partnership with Samsung, we will be focused initially on LG's open market devices across multiple geographies. In the big picture, our LG partnership is another validation of the value that our solutions can provide tier one OEMs. And on a related note, I also want to continue to reiterate that we have productive, ongoing discussions with many other OEMs, including several of the leading Chinese ones, that we hope will lead to additional formal global partnerships for us in future quarters. In short, we see a tremendous amount of opportunities to grow our global device count, which, as all of you know, is one of our three key key growth drivers for our business. Product diversification is another primary growth driver for the business. And in terms of product diversification for the December quarter, our newer products beyond dynamic installs nearly doubled year over year and reached an all-time high of 20% of our total revenues during the quarter as compared to 13% in the year ago December quarter and 2% in the December quarter two years ago. We saw encouraging performance metrics and heightened demand for many of our newer newer products during the quarter. Our notification and wizard products were the largest aggregate contributors of revenue growth, but other products such as Media Hub and Single Tap continue to show promise. And in particular, our media products worth a call out here. The recurring revenue nature of that business and our early positive returns were a catalyst for our pursuit of mobile posse, which I'll discuss later in my remarks. We are now live with our initial single tap with our first mobile measurement partner branch, and although it's taken us longer than expected to integrate with them, we still believe this integration is a catalyst for growth going forward. We continue to work with many other high-profile partners on single tap, including names such as Pinterest, Twitter, Epic Games, which owns the Fortnite franchise, to name a few. And lastly, I want to mention that we are continuing to make meaningful progress in discussions with select strategic partners regarding expansion into televisions and expect this new product and device category to be a growth driver for our overall business in the future. I want to now turn to our mobile policy acquisition. First, I want to call out and recognize founder and CEO John Jackson and the Mobile Posse team. 
John and I have talked a number of times over the years, and we have been admiring their progress. They've done an amazing job building their business from scratch. Six years ago, this was a business doing less than $10 million in revenue. Today, it's doing over $55 million annually with all of the revenues of a recurring nature, and as such, less sensitive to fluctuations in new smartphone sales from quarter to quarter. John's brought a great entrepreneurial spirit to his team in building that business. We believe we can now leverage their success and take it to a true global level with our scale, relationships, and operating expertise. Culturally, the moxie of the Mobile Posse team is something we really like well and resonate with. They not only understand the mobile ecosystem and share our vision of connecting the dots between mobile operators and OEMs to customers and advertisers that want to be on the home screen, but they do it with amazing hustle, professionalism, and a real attention to the details. Mobile Posse has many different mobile products that are complementary to our app install products. They have a minus one screen that you swipe left off the home screen for content, a product that powers the mobile operator's content portals, a home screen product, and also a product similar to our Media Hub product that curates news, weather, sports, and other content through an application and or a widget on the home screen. They monetize these products by way of programmatic advertising, and their platform works with the largest advertisers, such as highly recognizable names like Google, the Trade Desk, and Rubicon, to name a few. That is their demand and their source of revenues. And similar to us, they then pay their supply partners via revenue share, such as T-Mobile, MetroPCS, Boost, AT&T, Blue, and Cricket. We're excited about this transaction for many reasons. First, it is immediately accretive and being fully funded with our existing cash and debt resources. There is no dilution to digital turbine shareholders. Secondly, 100% of Mobile Posse's revenue are recurring and therefore will dramatically increase the overall percentage of our combined revenues that we derive from more predictably recurring revenue sources. Third, we're excited about the revenue synergies. Specifically, we, be we believe our ability to cross-market their differentiated products to our vast set of distribution partners, and conversely, cross-sell our DT products to their unique distribution partners, along with the opportunity to establish the combined entity as more of an advertising powerhouse with more products and more partners can improve the revenue per device on Mobile Posse's existing business. This acquisition fits hand in glove with our core diversification strategy. Post close, we expect the combined entity to generate more than one third of total revenue from recurrent sources and expect no single mobile operator or OEM distribution partner should be responsible for more, more than one third of our total company revenues. At close, CEO John Jackson will join our team as general manager of the mobile posse business to ensure we don't miss a beat on execution. And together we'll work to facilitate a smooth integration process while working to unlock revenue and cost synergies wherever possible. The bottom line is this will be a transformative acquisition for Digital Turbine and will significantly move the needle for a top line and bottom line growth trajectory. And with that, let me turn it over to Barrett to take you through the numbers. Thanks, Bill, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I step through our quarterly results, I'd like to cover our recent news on our agreement to acquire Mobile Posse. We're very excited about this transaction as it represents a unique opportunity for Digital Turbine. And while Bill touched on many of the strategic rationale points, from a tactical perspective, this acquisition enables us to gain access to a strong team, a new set of technologies, partners, and distribution channels, broaden our relationship with existing customers, and drive accretive financial performance. Now, in terms of deal specifics, we entered into an agreement with Mobile Posse to acquire all of the outstanding capital stock for an estimated total purchase consideration of $66 million, with $41.5 million paid in cash at closing and the balance through a 12-month earnout based on certain target net revenues, less associated revenue share, or what we refer to as our gross profit. 
We expect the cash consideration to be funded by a combination of existing cash balances, future cash flows from the combined operations, and debt financing. As this is an all-cash transaction, no equity will be issued as part of the purchase consideration for this transaction. While we will finalize our estimates of the transactions, final uh, financial impact, as well as the accounting for the transaction when we close the deal, which is expected in our fiscal Q4, I did want to share a little about Mobile Posse's profile based on their preliminary unaudited financials. First and foremost, we like their attractive financial model, which includes all recurring revenues, strong operating leverage, resulting in sustainable profitability, and positive free cash flows. For the calendar year ended December 2019, Mobile Posse generated revenue in excess of $55 million with profitable, healthy growth, gross profit and EBITDA margins, which are both accretive to our standalone results. I'm also very optimistic about this acquisition. John Jackson, Mobile Posse CEO, and the team at Mobile Posse have built a great business, and we are really looking forward to welcoming all the employees at Mobile Posse to the Digital Turbine team. I am confident that our teams will come together quickly and effectively. Now turning to the results in the quarter. We delivered strong results in our third quarter, which with continued top-line growth, along with expanding profit margins, enabled us to generate adjusted EBITDA of $5.6 million and $7 million in free cash flow during the quarter. As a reminder, my comments will refer to comparisons on a year-over-year -year basis and results for continuing operations unless otherwise noted. Revenue of $36 million in the quarter was up 18% versus the prior year. We experienced expanding margins with non-GAAP gross margins increasing to 40%, up over 300 basis points year-over-year, year, enabling us to generate $14.4 million in gross profit, representing a growth rate of 29% year-over-year. Year. Our gross margin expansion is largely <clears throat> being driven by successful diversification of partners and products on the platform and as a reminder, can be sensitive from quarter to quarter based on changes in partner mix and revenue type. Total operating expenses were $9.9 million during the, second, during the third quarter, as compared to $8.2 million in the prior year. Cash operating expenses totaled $8.9 million, representing an increase of 19% year over year, as gross profits are growing 29% in the same period. I will highlight that our operating leverage is being achieved even as we make a number of focused investments, specifically within our international business to support the initiatives that Bill outlined earlier, and to support new partners and products to drive future incremental revenues on the platform. Now turning to net income and cash flow. We achieved non-GAAP net income of five million, or five cents per share during the quarter. Adjusted EBITDA was $5.6 million in the quarter, up 47% over prior year, and mar margins continue to expand to 15.5% this quarter from 12.5% in the prior year quarter. Free cash flow totaled $7 million, an impressive increase of $5 million as compared to the prior year quarter, strengthening our network and capital position to a positive $11.7 million in the quarter, which is an improvement of 77 from the sequential quarter and better by 14.5 million over the same quarter last year. Our gap net income from continued operations for Q3 was 3.3 million or 4 cents per share based on 92.5 million weighted diluted shares outstanding compared to a third quarter of 2019 net loss of 1.1 million or 1 cent loss per share. Included in our gap net income for the quarter is a recorded loss of $0.9 million from the impact of the change in fair value of derivative liabilities connected to outstanding warrants issued related to our previously retired convertible notes. With respect to the balance sheet, the positive cash flow trends that I noted earlier contributed to a much stronger balance sheet at quarter end. We finished the quarter with $33.7 million in cash, up from $10.9 million in the prior year quarter and zero debt on the balance sheet. With the strength of our current balance sheet position and the accretive pro financial profile of the announced mobile policy acquisition, we're excited about our position to further bolster our balance sheet. 
Now let me turn to our outlook. We currently expect revenue for Q4 to grow between 33.2 million and 34.5 million, representing growth of 24% at the midpoint of this range, and expect adjusted EBITDA to grow to between 3.5 million and 4.0 million. Please note, our outlook is exclusive of any impact from the acquisition of Mobile Posse. With that, let me hand it back to the operator to open the call for questions. Operator? We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the key. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question is from Mike Maloof with Craig Hallam. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my questions, and um, congrats on the uh, pending acquisition of Mobile Posse. It sounds great. A couple of questions on that. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit? Of, you talked a little bit about how much growth they had in the last six years, but could you comment on uh, recent growth, uh, particularly 2019 um, uh, growth? And then when you talk about some cross-selling, um, I'm wondering if you could just uh, talk a little bit more with regards to carriers. Are there any particular uh, large carriers that uh, that they can get you into? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I'll, let me take the second part, and I'll turn it over to Barrett for the for the growth part of your question. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the things we're really excited about is not just the performance of their existing business and the EBITDA they're already generating and the revenue they've been able to grow over the, the past few years, but um, the ability for revenue synergies and the ability for us to take our products onto some of their distribution, which would include um, companies like T-Mobile uh, and Metro PCS, um, but also the ability for us to take their products onto our distribution, uh, both here in the United States uh, as well as outside the United States. And, you know, as, as I referenced in my prepared remarks, um, you know, the early returns on our, our Media Hub product were very encouraging. So the ability for us to leverage uh, mobile posses, similar situated products, and they're already built, already tuned, um, already ready to go onto our distribution, we think uh, it will generate some nice top line growth for us uh, in the future. So we see it going on on both sides. And then as far as the growth rate, I'll turn over to Barrett. Yeah, sure, Mike. Um, thanks, by the way. Yeah, we've, we've um, well, I won't comment directly on specifics with respect to prior year's growth. Um, we, we will disclose, you know, the, the appropriate financials when uh, we close the deal later this quarter. Um, but I will say, you know, you would have, you would have heard in our comments, um, you know, we, we think a, a lot of this team that, that um, at Mobile Posse and, you know, certainly centered on growth orientation and so they've they've seen a lot of growth and they've they've built uh, um, they've built a lot of products both existing and new products that uh, enable that growth over the long term so we're, we're, we're pretty excited about this uh, this acquisition okay great and then um, just a couple more uh, questions with regards to Samsung you know it sounds like you know certainly getting into to Brazil is a, is a big deal and and you continue to expand that relationship. Where are we now with regards to, say, the percentage of unlocked phones on Samsung, on Samsung as we stand now? Um, and how long do you think it'll take to get through all of those? Um, uh, and then maybe just a comment on LG. How big, as you sort of see the opportunity of LG versus Samsung, how big is that opportunity? Yeah, so, um, you yeah, know, first let me, let me talk about LG. I think that uh, – I think you know globally, you see LG is roughly about 10% of the size of Samsung in terms of global units sh shipped, um, and so we'll see what their roadmap looks like for the for the balance of of this year. Um, in terms of Samsung specifically, as I referenced, we're in you know 77 countries, um, many millions of devices. And how I like to think about Samsung is if I go back and I look at um, now how TrackPhone is ramped, or Cricket, or Verizon, or AT&T, they've all had this kind of really nice steady drumbeat over time, and we see. You know, continued momentum quarter over quarter with with uh, with different growth. Um, the great news about Samsung, as you're well aware, is they move north of 200 million um, smartphones a year. So the fact that you know we're talking about you know now getting on to kind of mid seven figures, you know, approaching eight figures of devices, we got a lot of room to grow that relationship. And um, you know, so our expectation is you saw a really nice clip of growth from December quarter compared to September, and we'd expect similarly, um, you know, to see similar growth for um, 
the March quarter and going and going forward. So uh, you know, I'd expect to see it continue to, to to grow at a real nice, healthy clip. Although you know, it's not like we're going to flip a switch and it's going to go to 200 million in the March quarter or anything like that. But I do think we're on a, a nice trajectory to continue to grow it, as evidenced by the increase both in models and by countries. Okay, great. Thanks for the help, guys. Thanks, Mike. The next question is from Darren Aftahi with Roth Capital Partners. Please go ahead. Hey guys, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, <clears throat> just going to follow up on a, on a couple things there. Um, on on mobile posse, um, so correct me if I'm wrong. So they have no international presence. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so a couple questions there. Number one, why is that the case? Uh, number two, how hard is that to kind of take internationally or their platform? And then three. Is there a leverageability point uh, a la your platform where you can actually take this to other screens besides hands up? Um, yeah, so the, the, the last question, Darren, absolutely. Um, and that's part of our thinking already um, within, you know, part of, the, part of the excitement here is, you know, we start thinking about televisions and, and advertising on televisions and how good of a job Mobile Posse does um, of doing that on, on home, home screens of smartphones. It's a natural extension. Um, so that, that, that's absolutely something that we're thinking about. As far as uh, the international piece of it, you know, this is one of the reasons I think Mobile Posse did the transaction is the ability to leverage our distribution and scale, and they just, you know, simply didn't have the reach that we have, as, as we know, for, for those of us that have been here for a number of years, it takes a while to get these relationships and, and get them established. And so, you know, the ability to, you know, now be able to have the opportunity to port that technology to a lot of these international partners is something that, um, you know, we're really encouraged by. And, you know, we're going to start talking about that at, at Mobile World Congress here in a, in a few weeks. So um, absolutely something that we're excited about uh, in terms of your platform, you know, some minor changes around the edges in terms of kind of internationalization and localization, but nothing that I would consider a, a material forklift in terms of supporting these international partners. Got it. And then just two, two more, if I may, um, maybe one for Barrett. So um, you said cash, and, cash on hand and uh, future cash flows and, and debt. What's kind of the right level for this combined entity to have kind of a cash balance? I'm just trying to understand how much of this is going to be finance versus kind of cash on the books. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if we think about, you know, we've got two businesses here that have, you know, positive working capital, right? And so the it's, it's, a, it's a nice equation to have. And so, you know, the amount of cash... That, that the company would need is, is you know, minimal, you know, call it five to $15 million. Darren, if we're, if we're thinking about that, given that it's it's got positive cash conversion, both both businesses. Um, so you should probably think about, um, you know, range of, of debt, and we're still finalizing some of these things, but, you know, in the range of 20 to $25 million of debt. Got it. That, that's helpful. Just last one for me. Um, so you guys have done a really good job in the past of, of being able to guide, you know, kind of in the face of, of some of these macro just headwinds on, on the handset. Um, so two questions here. One, I'm just curious, is there anything you kind of call out about November in particular with handset sales? And then as we contemplate your March quarter guidance, you know, is there any – type of inherent risk that this repeats itself in that in that quarter or is that kind of already factored in thanks yeah so um you know Darren I think that you know in terms of in terms of the guidance you know we were really surprised um of what we saw in just the month of November and I, and I called that out specifically because you know we actually exceeded our own internal plans for December uh, in, in terms of uh, what we thought, in terms of both devices and, and revenue from from other sources, so so you know, it was really a month of November, and I think November was really driven by a couple factors. You heard me reference on the last earnings call just the the shorter number of shopping days and, and those kind of things. And I think those dynamics were definitely at play. I also think in the month of November we saw a little bit more aggressive iOS promotional activity, um, you know, than we'd seen in prior years. Um, and so I think those two factors, amongst our core kind of four U.S. operators. Um, drove a, a surprising, disappointing performance, uh, but yet in December we didn't necessarily see that. So, um, you know, I kind of view that as a, as a one-month blip. I think we've got pretty good command and, and control over our device forecast. We're working pretty close with our partners, you know, on that on, on a go-forward basis, and, and have definitely baked that um, thinking and input into our guidance. Got it. Thank you. 
The next question is from Austin Moldau with Canaccord. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Um, the first one I just wanted to ask um, about Telefonica. Can you give us an update on on the timing and impact of that rollout that's expected? Yeah, so Austin, you know, we, we're really close to launching with Telefonica. We hope to have some good news on that soon. Um, we're kind of in the throes of, of uh, integration planning with them and Samsung um, as we speak. Uh, and expect to launch that in a number of countries in Latin America, including Brazil, uh, but also in the UK uh, as well. And then um, how we go with those first devices and, and first markets will really dictate the speed and intensity uh, by which we roll out from there. Okay. And and related to that, um, can you walk us through the um, revenue share in, in that uh, three-way relationship relative to what you're currently getting with Samsung and uh, how adding a partner to the mix will, will change that? Yeah, so there's kind of two, two elements there. Um, one is the um, how it works with Samsung, and then one will be how it works without Samsung devices and other third parties, and so those are, those are separate. Uh, in aggregate, we know we're not going to give the specifics of any specific any agreement here on, on, on the call, but what I will say is um, what we are doing with Telefonica in aggregate is not going to be detrimental to our overall margin structure. Got it. And um, for RPD, I think you said RPD from the, the four major U.S. partners was over $3. Can you get any more granular with that or, or maybe share the, the growth rate on that? Or uh, maybe if you can only speak qualitatively, can you just talk about some of the drivers there or which of the partners perhaps, you know, did worse or better? Thanks. Yeah, sure. So I think that um, you know, it's really comprised of, of two things. You know, one is, is, is more media being run and those media partners paying higher rates. And then the second is um, the new product growth, you know, really starting to kick in. As, as we referenced, you know, for the first time, we were able to hit 20% of our revenues coming from non-dynamic installs. And so that, you know, that's one driver of the, of the $3 that we saw. And then the other one is just our media partners, um, you know, spending more across different types of categories. Um, in terms of you know partners I call out or maybe more in general is I think we continue, continue to do a, a great job on on flagship high profile devices, um, and I can say that we, you know, we continue to have some work to do to improve our RPD on kind of lower end or, or lower tier devices um, in terms of how we see the growth bifurcated out. So for something like for example 5G that would that would be a tailwind um, for us, uh, but to the extent we see lower end devices come in the market that may be a little bit of a headwind in terms of aggregate RPD. Got it. Thanks very much. The next question is from Lee Kral with B. Riley FBR. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, could you maybe just, uh, on the mobile policy acquisition, touch base on whether there's any cost synergies associated with the combination? Yeah, let me talk. Let me talk at a high level. Alternative Barrett. Yeah, this, this is a revenue synergies deal, not a, not a cost synergies deal. Um, with that being said, um, you know there may be some cost synergies in terms of our hosting agreements with AWS, where we've got more purchasing power and buying power. Um, you know, and some things around the edges like that. But this is really about investment and revenue synergies, and how do we continue to grow the top line business? Um, you know, for the go forward companies. But Barrett, I'm not going to add anything else into that. No, I think you hit on it. This is, you know, a growth acquisition. While there'll be some small, some small corporate costs that that are avoided in the future. Um, you know, we like their we like their culture. We like uh, their their financial model. As, as both Bill and I mentioned, uh, they've got a lot of a lot of operating leverage in their in their model. Uh, but this is this is a growth play and a revenue play. Got it. And then um, switching over to single tap uh, for Samsung, uh, you guys announced it on the last call. Maybe provide an update there, and, and perhaps an update on the timeline to to generating revenue with single tap on Samsung. Um, yeah, so uh, we we expect it to occur imminently. We actually have a couple of our senior guys down in Brazil um, as we speak. Um, they're gonna. I think there's Samsung's actually having a, a kickoff event for our single tap launch in, in Brazil later this week. So. Um, we're just kind of getting going with the planning and getting de local demand partners there excited about it. And um, as soon as we start bringing some of those demand partners on, you know, expect it to, to go live uh, sometime later this quarter. Um, and, uh, you know, just the overall international single tap story is something we're also have been um, encouraged by, um, you know, as well as we're going forward. 
Got it. And then just the last one from me. Um, you guys kind of talked about making investments in the sales force, especially internationally. Um, kind of where are we on the timeline for those investments translating to kind of increased productivity around RPD for some of the lower-end devices? Um, yeah, so, so when we think about, you know, our investments and our, our channel strategy, we really think about it across three dimensions. We think about, you know, automation and self-serve is, is one to really capture the long tail of, of app providers. Um, we think about growing. Number two is our um, existing sales force and continuing to, you know, add bodies um, in local areas where it makes sense. And then number three is really the establishment of channel partnerships and agency partnerships where we can um, work with third parties that are already in the process of selling media, whether it's app installs or other types of media, and, and be able to leverage their footprint and relationships. And we're making investments across all three of those areas um, right now, and we're already starting to see some efficiencies you know, from that. And uh, so as we think about especially scaling the international part of the, of the demand, I would really focus on more channel partnerships to cast a wider net and then more self-serve options for some of the, the, the long tail of app providers in some of these countries that will be able to be the key catalyst to drive improved productivity. Got it. Thanks for taking my questions. Great. Thanks, Lee. The next question is from John Hickman with Ladenburg. Please go ahead. Hey. Um, uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, Bill, almost all my questions have been an asked and answered, uh, but I would appreciate your comments on what's going on in China versus uh, with the virus. Is your March guidance factoring in some possible, like, softness there this quarter? Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, so in, in regards to China, um, you know, the, the good news for us is that, you know, we don't have any partnerships in China. We're not doing business in China. You know, we're really focused on a, what I call a China out strategy, which is how do we help the Chinese uh, OEMs and the Chinese app developers like Tencent and Alibaba? You know, we're working a lot with TikTok right now. How do we continue to expand, you know, their presence outside of China to other international markets, whether it's U.S., Latin America, Europe, et cetera? So, you know, in regards to the virus, um, we're not seeing any impact there because it's really focused, all those activities are focused on outside of China. Um, we've got a lot of, um, you know, exciting Chinese OEM um, opportunities in the pipeline right now. Um, I will say some of not just the virus, but also some of the other macro noise that's going on is is is, is definitely um, you know been a little bit of a headwind on some of those deals. But you know we expect as that goes away, um, you know we've got the, the the macro kind of thesis of our opportunity to work with those Chinese OEMs is something you know we're really excited about. So stay tuned. Okay, um, and then um, so. When do you think – I know you said you were going to close – you think you're going to close the acquisition this quarter. Um, do you think it's going to take most of the quarter to get that done? Yeah, there's not anything really complex about the close activity. And so, yeah, we think um, probably the um, – you know, we, we're, we're probably weeks away here from closing. Oh, okay. So that will put you into March, right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. The next question is from Alan Clay with National Securities Corporation. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, how do you um, think about how um, the new 5G phones are going to impact calendar 2020? And do you believe that kind of overall devices in U.S. that, that you'll are going to decline or that there, there's an opportunity for that to grow? Uh, yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, we we expect to start seeing an increase of 5G devices, you know, as we kind of go out go out through 2020. Yeah, you know, I just saw an article um, a few days ago, actually, that you know, AT&T just lit up 13 more cities um, with their 5G product. Uh, so as those cities come online, you know, would expect devices to follow. And I think, it, as you're well aware, um, there's not an Apple 5G device, you know, that's expected to come out until the back end of this year. Uh, so it's so it's only Android. So as those markets light up, um, I think that's something that will definitely benefit us. I, I just would make a point too: as those markets light up, it's in the operator's interest to get the 5G devices in the hand, just because the cost to deliver all the video and other high bandwidth applications is better for the carrier. So it's not just the customer um, pulling the device; it'd be the carrier pushing the device, you know, onto onto the marketplace. And so you know that's something you know we would expect to start seeing as, as we start seeing more and more high-profile. Uh, 5G devices launch like the like the um, 
you know, the Samsung devices, LG, Motorola, et cetera. Thank you. My other question is um, for, for new products, you, you grew that to around 20% of, of revenue. And I was wondering, is there a way we can think about like how penetrated that is in the overall like number of devices you sell to try to kind of figure out what the opportunity is there? Yeah, well, I, you, you'd have to break apart. Um, that, that's not exactly the way we look at it because, um, you know, not all devices are created equal. Um, you know, we really look at what portion of the RPD or the total revenue streams um, are we driving from non-dynamic install. Um, so that's how we've measured it. Um, I wouldn't have off, offhand um, a way to translate that to per device, but, um, you know, we, we like the direction um, that we're moving and diversifying this, these, pro, these new product streams. Um, as Bill said, you know, hitting 20% was, was a, you know, an important step for us. Great. Thank you so much. Good. Thanks, Alan. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Bill Stone for any closing remarks. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining the call today. We look forward to reporting on our progress against all the points we made on today's call. And we'll talk to you again on our fiscal 2020 fourth quarter call in a few months. Thanks, and have a great night. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.